Story ten of Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Ten Christmas Stories by Edward Everett Hale. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story ten: The Survivor's Story. Fortunately, we were with our wives. It is in general an excellent custom, as I will explain if opportunity is given. First, you are thus sure of good company. For four mortal hours we had ground along, and stopped and waited and started again, in the drifts between Westfield and Springfield. We had shrieked out our woes by the voices of fire-engines. Brave men had dug, patient men had sate inside, and waited for the results of the digging. At last, in triumph, at eleven and three-quarters, as they say in Cinderella, we entered the Springfield station. It was Christmas Eve. Leaving the train to its devices, Blatchford and his wife, her name was Sarah, and I with mine, her name was Phoebe, walked quickly with our little sacks out of the station, ploughed and waded along the white street, not to the Massasoit, no, but to the old eagle and star, which was still standing and was a favourite with us youngsters good waffles, maple syrup ad lib, such fixings of other sorts as we preferred, and some liberty. The amount of liberty in absolutely first-class hotels is but small. A drowsy boy waked and turned up the gas. Blatchford entered our names on the register and cried at once, By George, Wolfgang is here, and Dick, what luck! For Dick and Wolfgang also travel with their wives. The boy explained that they had come up the river in the New Haven train, were only nine hours behind time, had arrived at ten, and had just finished supper and gone to bed. We ordered rare beefsteak, waffles, dip toast, omelettes with kidneys, and omelettes without. We toasted our feet at the open fire in the parlour, we ate the supper when it was ready, and we also went to bed rejoicing that we had home with us, having travelled with our wives, and that we could keep our merry Christmas here. If only Wolfgang and Dick and their wives would join us, all would be well. Wolfgang's wife was named Bertha, and Dick's was named Hosanna, a name I have never met with elsewhere. Bed followed, and I am a graceless dog that I do not write a sonnet here on the unbroken slumber that followed breakfast by arrangement of us four at nine at nine thirty to us enter bertha dick hosanna and wolfgang to name them in alphabetical order four chairs had been turned down for them four chops four omelettes and four small oval dishes of fried potatoes had been ordered and now appeared immense shouting immense kissing among those who had that privilege general wondering and great congratulating that our wives were there solid resolution that we would advance no farther here and here only in springfield itself would we celebrate our christmas day it uh, may be remarked in parenthesis that we had learned already that no train had entered the town since eleven and a quarter and it was known by telegraph that none was within thirty-four miles and a half of the spot at the moment the vow was made. We waited and ploughed our way through the snow to church. I think Mr. Rumfrey, if that is the gentleman's name, who preached an admirable Christmas sermon in a beautiful church there is, will remember the platoon of four men and four women who made perhaps a fifth of his congregation in that storm, a storm which shut off most church-going. Home again, a jolly fire in the parlour, dry stockings and dry slippers, turkeys and all things fitting for the dinner, and then a general assembly, not in a caravansary, not in a coffee-room, but in the regular guest's parlour of a New England second-class hotel, where, as it was ordered, there were no transients but ourselves that day and whence all the boarders had gone either to their own rooms or to other homes. For people who have their wives with them, it is not difficult to provide entertainment on such an occasion. Bertha, said Wolfgang, could you not entertain us with one of your native dances? 
Oh, slave, said Dick to Hosanna, play upon the virginals. And Hosanna played a lively Arab air on the tavern piano, while the fair Bertha danced with a spirit unusual. Was it indeed in memory of the Christmas of her own dear home in Circassia? All that from Bertha to Circassia is not so. We did not do this at all. That was a slip of the pen. What we did was this. John Blatchford pulled the bell-cord till it broke. They always break in novels, and sometimes they do in taverns. This bell-cord broke. The sleepy boy came, and John said, Catliff, is there never a barber in the house? The frightened boy said there was, and John bade him send him. In a minute the barber appeared, black as was expected, with a shining face and white teeth and in shirt-sleeves and broad grins. Do tell me, Caesar, said John, that in your country they do not wear their coats on Christmas Day. Sartin they do, sir, when they go outdoors. Do you tell me, Caesar, said Dick, that they have doors in your country? Sartin they do, said poor Caesar, flurried. Boy, said I, the gentlemen are making fun of you. They want to know if you ever keep Christmas in your country without a dance. Never, sar, said poor Caesar. Do they dance without music? No, sar, never. Go, then, I said in my sternest accents, go fetch a zittern, or a banjo, or a kit, or a hurdy-gurdy, or a fiddle. The black boy went, and returned with his violin. And as the light grew grey, and crept into the darkness, and as the darkness gathered more thick and more, he played for us, and he played for us, tune after tune. And we danced first with precision, then in sport, then in wild holiday frenzy. We began with waltzes, so great is the convenience of travelling with your wives. Where should we have been had we been all soul alone, four men? Probably playing whist or ochre. And now we began with waltzes, which passed into polkas, which subsided into round dances, and then in very exhaustion we fell back in a grave quadrille. I danced with Hosanna, Wolfgang and Sarah were our vis-a-vis. -vis. We went through the same set that Noah and his three boys danced in the ark with their four wives, and which has been danced ever since, in every moment, on one or another spot of the dry earth, going round it with the sun, like the drum-beat of England right and left, first two forward, right hand across, pastoral, the whole series of them. We did them with as much spirit as if it had been on a flat on the side of Ararat, ground yet too muddy for croquet. Then Blatchford called for Virginia Reel, and we raced and chased through that. Poor Caesar began to get exhausted, but a little flip from downstairs helped him amazingly. And after the flip, Dick cried, Can you not dance Money Musk? And in one wild frenzy of delight we danced Money Musk, and Hull's Victory, and Dusty Miller, and Youth's Companion, and Irish Jigs, on the closet door lifted off for the occasion, till the men lay on the floor screaming with the fun, and the women fell back on the sofas, fairly faint with laughing. All this last, since the sentence after Circassia, is a mistake. There was not any bell, nor any barber, and we did not dance at all. This was all a slip of my memory. What we really did was this. John Blatchford said, Let us all tell stories. It was growing dark, and he had put more logs on the fire. Bertha said, Heap on more wood, the wind is chill but let it whistle as it will, we'll keep our merry Christmas still. She said that because it was in Bertha's Visit, a very stupid book which she remembered. Then Wolfgang told the Penny-a-Liner story. Wolfgang is a reporter, or was then, on the staff of the Star. When I was on the Tribune, he never was on the Tribune an hour, unless he calls selling the Tribune at Fort Plains being on the Tribune, but I tell the story as he told it. 
He said, "When I was on the Tribune, I was dispatched to report Mr. Webster's great reply to Hayne. This was in the days of stages. We had to ride from Baltimore to Washington early in the morning to get there in time. I found my boots were gone from my room when the stage man called me, and I reported that speech in worsted slippers my wife had given me the week before." As we came into Bladensburg, it grew light, and I recognized my boots on the feet of my fellow passenger. There was but one other man in the stage. I turned to claim them, but stopped in a moment, for it was Webster himself. How serene his face looked as he slept there! He woke soon, passed the time of day, offered me a part of a sandwich, for we were old friends. I was counsel against him in the Ogden case. Said Webster to me, Steele, I am bothered about this speech. I have a paragraph in it which I cannot word up to my mind. And he repeated it to me. How would this do, said he? Let us hope that the sense of unrestricted freedom may be so intertwined with the desire to preserve a connection of the several parts of the body politic that some arrangement more or less lasting may prove in a measure satisfactory. How would that do? I said I liked the idea, but the expression seemed involved. And it is involved, said Webster, but I can't improve it. How would this do, said I? Liberty and union, now and forever, one and inseparable. Capital, he said, capital! Write that down for me. At that moment we arrived at the capital steps. I wrote down the words for him, and from my notes he read them when that place in the speech came along. All of us applauded the story. Phoebe then told the schoolmistress's story. You remind me of the impression that very speech made on me as I heard Henry Chapin deliver it at an exhibition at Leicester Academy. I resolved then that I would free the slave or perish in the attempt. But how? I, a woman, disenfranchised by the law? Ha! I saw. I went to Arkansas. I opened a normal college or academy for teachers. We had balls every second night to make it popular. Immense numbers came. Half the teachers of the southern states were trained there. I had admirable instructors in oil painting and music, the most essential studies. The arithmetic I taught myself. I taught it well. I achieved fame. I achieved wealth. Invested in Arkansas five per cents. Only one secret device I persevered in. To all, old and young, innocent girls and sturdy men, I so taught the multiplication table that one fatal error was hidden in its array of facts. The nine line is the difficult one. I buried the error there. Nine times six, I taught them, is fifty-six. The rhyme made it easy. The gilded falsehood passed from lip to lip, from state to state. One little speck in a chain of golden verity. I retired from teaching. Slowly I watched the growth of the rebellion. At last the aloe blossom shot up, after its hundred years of waiting. The southern heart was fired. I brooded over my revenge. I repaired to Richmond. I opened a first-class boarding-house, where all the cabinet and most of the senate came for their meals, and I had eight permanents. Soon their brows clouded. The first flush of victory passed away. Night after night they sat over their calculations, which all came wrong. I smiled, and was a villain. None of their sums would prove. None of their estimates matched the performance. Never a muster-roll that fitted as it should do. And I, the despised boarding-mistress, I alone knew why. Often and often, when Memminger has said to me with an oath, Why this discordancy in our totals? have my lips burned to tell the secret. But no, I hid it in my bosom, and when at last I saw a black regiment march into Richmond singing, John Brown, I cried for the first time in twenty years. 
nine times six is fifty-four, and gloated in my sweet revenge. Then was hushed the harp of Phoebe, and Dick told his story. The Inspector of Gas Meters' Story Mine is a tale of the ingratitude of republics. It is well nigh thirty years since I was walking by the Owego and Ithaca Railroad, a crooked road not then adapted to high speed. Of a sudden I saw that a long cross-timber on a trestle high above a swamp had sprung up from its ties. I looked for a spike with which to secure it. I found a stone with which to hammer the spike, but at this moment a train approached downhill. I screamed. They heard, but the engine had no power to stop the heavy train. With the presence of mind of a poet and the courage of a hero, I flung my own weight on the fatal timber. I would hold it down or perish. The engine came. The elasticity of the pine timber whirled me in the air. But I held on. The tender crossed. Again I was flung in wild gyrations. But I held on. It is no bed of roses, I said, but what act of Parliament was there that I should be happy? Three passenger cars and ten freight cars, as was then the vicious custom of that road, passed me. But I held on, repeating to myself texts of Scripture to give me courage. As the last car passed, I was whirled into the air by the rebound of the rafter. Heavens, I said. If my orbit is a hyperbola, I shall never return to earth. Hastily I estimated its ordinance and calculated the curve. What bliss! It was a parabola. After a flight of a hundred and seventeen cubits, I landed, head down, in a soft mud hole. In that train was the young U.S. Grant, on his way to West Point for examination but for me the armies of the republic would have had no leader i pressed my claim when i asked to be appointed to england although no one else wished to go i alone was forgotten such is gratitude with republics he ceased then sarah blatchford told the wheeler and wilson's operatives story my father had left the anchorage of sorrento for a short voyage if voyage it may be called. Life was young, and this world seemed heaven. The yacht bowled on under close-reefed stay-sails, and all was happy. Suddenly the corsairs seized us. All were slain in my defence, but I, this fatal gift of beauty, bade them spare my life. Why linger on my tale? In the Zenana of the Shah of Persia I found my home. How escape his eye, I said, and fortunately I remembered that in my reticule I carried one box of F. Kidder's indelible ink. Instantly I applied the liquid in the large bottle to one cheek. Soon as it was dry, I applied that in the small bottle and sat in the sun one hour. My head ached with the sunlight, but what of that? I was a fright, and I knew all would be well. I was consigned, so soon as my hideous deficiencies were known, to the sewing-room. Then how I sighed for my machine! Alas, it was not there, but I constructed an imitation from a cannon-wheel, a coffee-mill, and two nutcrackers, and with this I made the underclothing for the palace and the zenana. I also vowed revenge, nor did I doubt one instant how for in my youth I had read Lucretia Borgia's memoirs, and I had a certain rule for slowly slaying a tyrant at a distance. I was in charge of the Shaw's own linen. Every week I set back the buttons on his shirt-collars by the width of one thread, or, by arts known to me, I shrunk the binding of the collar by a like proportion. Tighter and tighter with each week did the vice close around his larynx, Week by week, at the high religious festivals, I could see his face was blacker and blacker. At length the hated tyrant died. The leeches called it a apoplexy. I did not undeceive them. His guards sacked the palace. 
I bagged the diamonds, fled with them to Trebizond, and sailed thence in a cake to South Boston. No more. Such memories oppress me. Her voice was hushed. I told my tale in turn. The conductor's story. I was poor. Let this be my excuse, or rather my apology. I entered a Third Avenue car at 36th Street and saw the conductor sleeping. Satan tempted me, and I took from him his badge. I see the hated figures now. When he woke, he knew not he had lost it. The car started, and he walked to the rear. With the badge on my coat, I collected eight fares within, stepped forward, and sprang into the street. Poverty is my only apology for the crime. I concealed myself in a cellar where men were playing with props. Fear is my only excuse. Lest they should suspect me, I joined their game, and my forty cents were soon three dollars and seventy. With these ill-gotten gains I visited the gold exchange, then open evenings. My superior intelligence enabled me to place well my modest means, and at midnight I had a competence. Let me be a warning to all young men. Since that night I have never gambled more. I threw the hated badge into the river. I bought a palace on Murray Hill, and led an upright and honorable life. But since that night of terror the sound of the horse-cars oppresses me. Always since, to go uptown or down, I order my own coupé with George to drive me and never have I entered the cleanly, sweet, and airy carriage provided for the public. I cannot. Conscience is too much for me. You see in me a monument of crime. I said no more. A moment's pause, a few natural tears, and a single sigh hushed the assembly. Then Bertha, with her siren voice, told the wife of Biddeford's story. At the time you speak of, I was the private governess of two lovely boys, Julius and Pompey, Pompey the senior of the two. The black-eyed darling, I see him now. I also see, hanging to his neck, his blue-eyed brother, who had given Pompey his black eye the day before. Pompey was generous to a fault, Julius parsimonious beyond virtue. I therefore instructed them in two different rooms. To Pompey I read the story of Waste Not, Want Not. To Julius, on the other hand, I spoke of the all-love of his great mother nature and her profuse gifts to her children. Leaving him with grapes and oranges, I stepped back to Pompey and taught him how to untie parcels so as to save the string. Leaving him winding the string neatly, I went back to Julius and gave to him ginger cakes. The dear boys grew from year to year. They outgrew their knickerbockers and had trousers. They outgrew their jackets and became men. And I felt that I had not lived in vain. I had conquered nature. Pompey, the little spendthrift, was the honored cashier of a savings bank till he ran away with the capital. Julius, the miser, became the chief croupier at the new Crockford's, one of those boys is now in Botany Bay, and the other is in Sierra Leone. "'I thought you were going to say in a hotter place,' said John Blatchford, and he told his story. THE STOKER'S STORY We were crossing the Atlantic in a Cunarder. I was second stoker on the starboard watch. In that horrible gale we spoke of before dinner, the coal was exhausted and I, as the best-dressed man, was sent up to the captain to ask what we should do. I found him himself at the wheel. He almost cursed me and bade me say nothing of coal at a moment when he must keep her head to the wind with her full power, or we were lost. He bade me slide my hand into his pocket, and take out the key of the after-freight room, open that, and use the contents for fuel. I returned hastily to the engine-room, and we did as we were bid. The room contained nothing but old account-books, which made a hot and effective fire. On the third day the captain came down himself into the engine-room, 
where I had never seen him before, called me aside, and told me that by mistake he had given me the wrong key, asking me if I had used it. I pointed to him the empty room. Not a leaf was left. He turned pale with fright. As I saw his emotion, he confided to me the truth. The books were the evidences or accounts of the British national debt, of what is familiarly known as the Consolidated Fund or the Consoles. They had been secretly sent to New York for the examination of James Fisk, who had been asked to advance a few millions on this security to the English exchequer, and now all evidence of indebtedness was gone. The captain was about to leap into the sea, but I dissuaded him. I told him to say nothing. I would keep his secret. No man else knew it. The government would never know it. It was safe in our hands. He reconsidered his purpose. We came safe to port and did nothing. Only on the first quarter day which followed I obtained leave of absence and visited the Bank of England to see what happened. At the door was this placard. Applicants for dividends will file a written application with name and amount at desk A and proceed in turn to the paying teller's office. I saw their ingenuity. They were making out new books, certain that none would apply but those who were accustomed to. So skillfully do men of government study human nature. I stepped lightly to one of the public desks. I took one of the blanks. I filled it out. John Blatchford, 1,747 pounds, 6 shillings, 8 pence and handed it in at the open trap. I took my place in the queue in the teller's room. After an agreeable hour, a pile, not thick, of Bank of England notes was given to me, and since that day I have quarterly drawn that amount from the maternal government of that country. As I left the teller's room, I observed the captain in the queue. He was the seventh man from the window, and I have never seen him more. We then ask Hosanna for her story. The N.E. Historical Genealogist's Story My story, said she, will take us far back into the past. It will be necessary for me to dwell on some incidents in the first settlement of this country, and I propose that we first prepare and enjoy the Christmas tree. After this, if your courage holds, you shall hear an over-true tale pretty creature, how little she knew what was before us. As we sat listening to the stories, we had been preparing for the tree. Shopping being out of the question, we were fain from our own stores to make up our presents, while the women were arranging nuts and blown eggshells and popcorn strings from the stores of the Eagle and Star. The popping of corn in two corn poppers had gone on through the whole of the storytelling. All being so nearly ready, I called the drowsy boy again, and, showing him a very large stick in the wood-box, asked him to bring me a hatchet. To my great joy he brought the axe of the establishment, and I bade him farewell. How little did he think what was before him! So soon as he had gone, I went stealthily down the stairs, and, stepping out into the deep snow in front of the hotel, looked up into the lovely night. The storm had ceased, and I could see far back into the heavens. In the still evening my strokes might have been heard far and wide as I cut down one of the two pretty Norways that shaded Mr. Pynchon's front walk next the hotel. I dragged it over the snow. Blatchford and Steele lowered sheets to me from the large parlour window, which I attached to the larger end of the tree. With infinite difficulty they hauled it in. I joined them in the parlour, and soon we had as stately a tree growing there as was in any home of joy that night in the river counties. With swift fingers did our wives adorn it. I should have said above that we travelled with our wives, and that I would recommend that custom to others. It was impossible under the circumstances to maintain much secrecy but it had been agreed that all who wished to turn their backs to the circle in the preparation of presents might do so without offence to the others. 
as the presents were wrapped one by one in paper of different colors they were marked with the names of giver and receiver and placed in a large clothes basket at last all was done i had wrapped up my knife my pencil case my letter case for steel blatchford and dick to my wife i gave my gold watch key which fortunately fits her watch to hosanna a mere trifle a seal ring i wore to bertha my gold chain and to sarah blatchford the watch which generally hung from it for a few moments we retired to our rooms while the pretty hosanna arranged the forty-nine presents on the tree then she clapped her hands and we rushed in what a wondrous sight what a shout of infantine laughter and charming prattle for in that happy moment were we not all children again i see my story hurries to its close dick who is the tallest mounted a step-ladder and called us by name to receive our presents i had a nice gold watch-key from hosanna a knife from steel a letter-case from phoebe and a pretty pencil-case from bertha dick had given me his watch-chain which he knew i fancied sarah blatchford a little toy of a geneva watch she wore and her husband a handsome seal-ring a present to him from the czar i believe phoebe that is my wife for we were travelling with our wives had a pencil-case from steel a pretty little letter-case from dick a watch-key from me and a french repeater from blatchford sarah blatchford gave her the knife she carried with some bright verses saying that it was not to cut love bertha a watch-chain and hosanna a ring of turquoise and amethysts the other presents were similar articles and were received as they were given with much tender feeling but at this moment as dick was on the top of the flight of steps handing down a red apple from the tree a slight catastrophe occurred the first i was conscious of was the angry hiss of steam in a moment i perceived that the steam boiler from which the tavern was warmed had exploded the floor beneath us rose and we were driven with it through the ceiling and the rooms above through an opening in the roof into the still night around us in the air were flying all the other contents and occupants of the star and eagle how bitterly was i reminded of dick's flight from the railroad track of the ithaca and owego railroad but i could not hope such an escape as his still my flight was in a parabola and in a period not longer than it has taken to describe it i was thrown senseless at last into a deep snow-bank near the united states arsenal tender hands lifted me and assuaged me tender teams carried me to the city hospital tender eyes brooded over me tender science cared for me it proved necessary before i recovered to amputate my two legs at the hips my right arm was wholly removed by a delicate and curious operation from the socket we saved the stump of my left arm which was amputated just below the shoulder i am still in the hospital to recruit my strength the doctor does not like to have me occupy my mind at all but he says there is no harm in my compiling my memoirs or writing magazine stories my faithful nurse has laid me on my breast on a pillow has put a camel's hair pencil in my mouth and feeling almost personally acquainted with john carter the artist i have written out for you in his method the story of my last christmas i am sorry to say that the others have never been found end of story 10